All right, so this is chapter 10 um, from Choo Choo's house. Still, I put off my return, for April came and the planting of the new rice shoots, and after that, Ling brought a, pam bought, brought a pamphlet telling of how rice and fish might be grown together. The agriculture agent in the government office where I got the pamphlet will give Hana fingerlings to put in the patty, and they will cost you nothing. Fingerlings? Read the pamphlet. They are tiny fish that will grow while the, while the rice grows. By the end of August, you will have two crops to harvest. I did not always believe in Ling's pamphlets, for he had so many of them, yet his orchard had grown from the pamphlets. It's like a brochure that you get, you know, like in the, you get them in the map store and stuff, like all the little brochures about things. Remember when we went to the extension office and they had all this um, brochures on soil and different ways you can farm? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Hana believed even less in the pamphlets. I want nothing to do with the government, she said. It was the government that put Kwan in prison for moving about in his own country. It was the government that told your parents how many children they could have. So babies are sold like so many bags of rice. But Hana, I said, this is only the village agriculture agent. I've seen him at the tea house with his bird cage. He whispers to his bird in such a sweet way. I'm sure no trouble would come of it. In the pamphlet, it says the fish eat not only the weeds, but the mosquitoes as well. You know how you complain of the mosquitoes. Even if there were not enough fish to sell, there would be some for our meals. I will ask the Zangs for advice, Hana said. The next day, though I begged her not to, she made the trip to the Zangs home, returning out of breath and sinking down upon a chair, pale and shaking with the exertion of climbing the hill. The Zangs had seen how Ling's pear and plum and peach trees had grown from the pamphlets. They must have said as much to Hana, for she reluctantly agreed to go with me to the agriculture agent and ask for the little fish. A nearby farmer was going into the village to buy straw and offered to take us there in his wagon and bring us back so that Hana would not have to walk. The government office was not like the detention center in Shanghai. There were no people sitting on long benches with sad faces, only the agricultural agent I had seen in the tea house. The office was small and dusty with pamphlets everywhere and with signs saying the pamphlets were free for the taking. Slogans were taped to the wall to encourage farmers to serve China by increasing their crops. A great crop will make a great country and the farmer is the greatest, is the heart of China. The agent asked courteously, courteously what we wanted and Hana said, we have a small rice patty and you have small fish. We would like your fish for our patty. The agent asked where the patty was, and opening a large book, he turned the pages until he came to the place that showed Hana's patty, along with all the other patties nearby. When he saw the patty was there, he nodded as if it pleased, if he was pleased with Hana's request. Yes, that is a good plan, he said. New fingerlings came this morning. He went into the back room and returned with a basket in which there were plastic boxes full of water and hundreds of fish, no more than a few millimeters in size. Laughing, he said, when the fish are, bring, are big, bring me one for my dinner. Hana bowed and thanked the officer, gingerly holding the basket as if the little fish might escape from the boxes and attack her. Quickly, she handed the basket to me and made her escape from the office. When we were outside, she said, how can such a fine, tiny fish come to anything? Is it foolishness? Still, the plastic boxes in the basket will come in handy. The fingerlings went into the rice patty as the pamphlet instructed, and after that, I had company as I weeded. The little fat fish swam between my toes and made small splashes as they rose to catch the mosquitoes. In no time, they were as large as my finger. I brought Hana to the patty to see how they grew. And she shook her head in wonder, but she worried. What if they eat the rice? No, I promised. The pamphlet says they eat only the grass. Still, she not, did not believe in this pamphlet. Now there were enemies to battle. The kingfishers came, the black and white ones with the feathery crests, the blue ones with the orange bills, and the ones with the fiery orange breasts. They hovered in the bamboo branches, and when my back was turned, they dove into the water and flew away with the fish in their bills. Even w worse were the herons. There had always been herons in the patties, for there were frogs and crawfish. Now they came more often. They stayed away in the daytime when I was there, but at twilight they waded through the patties, their great long legs moving so slowly that har they hardly disturbed the water, their long, cruel beaks coming down mercilessly on the growing fish. Still many fish remained, and when August came, just as Ling had said, we had fish to sell. You must buy a net, Ling said. I have a net already, I told him. I had bought sturdy string in the village, and with the skill I had learned from Yi Yi, I had made my own net and fastened it to a bamboo pole. Ling was impressed. You'll catch them and clean them, he said. I laughed. I can clean the fish much faster than you. It was true. For every fish that Ling cleaned, I cleaned too. Each day I caught enough fish to take into the village to sell, and each day I brought back money for Hana. We had fished for dinner each night. Several of the fish were sent with Ling to the Zangs. Some of the fish were dried, and the largest fish I brought to the agent in the agricultural agent, agent office. There was 
no thought now of returning to my family, for Hana had grown weak, grown weak and kept to the house. At first I thought her illness was worry over Quan, but her letter came from Quan full of good news. Because of all the building in Shanghai and because of his skill as a stonemason, something he had learned from his bapa, he had been given a residence permit. The threat of being arrested was over. Hana smiled, but still the weakness grew. I urged her to see the village doctor, but she would not go to him. He can't give me a new heart, she said. Ling, who read the newspapers in the village, said that in time, some, he said that in some large cities, new hearts were given. Hana was horrified. Ah, and what if a cruel heart were put into my body? I would never take the chance. It was on the day when the last of the rice had been harvested that two policemen came by our house. They were not the familiar village policemen. Hana was inside and I was in the courtyard threshing the rice grains we keep for ourselves. The sight of the policemen set my heart racing. Perhaps Quan was in new trouble or they had discovered that I had run away. The policemen paused when they saw me. They looked to me like herons, tall and thin and treacherous, as if they were ready to pounce. One of the herons said, we are looking for the Zhang's house and for Zhang Ling. Do you know him? He smiled as he asked, but he was looking at me as if he were considering if I might make a meal. Zhang? No, I know of no Zhangs around here, I said, and went back to my threshing. They rounded a corner and were out of sight. I flew up to the hill to the Zhangs, taking a shortcut. Ling was cleaning out the stable and changing the beast's straw. Policemen are asking for you, I managed to get out. I told them I didn't know who you are. Ling, what have you done? It must be the books, he said. I was careless in getting the last one, buying it from someone I did not know. He began pulling several of his books from his shelf and throwing them into a pile of the beast's manure, shoveling the manure on top of the books. There were tears in his eyes. They won't look there, he said in a grim voice. He turned to me. Go back to your house at once. You told them you didn't know me. They mustn't find you here. And Chuju, thank you. You have saved me. Now go, quickly. I saw the policeman coming up the hill and hid behind some boulders until they entered the Zhang's house. Then I fled to our courtyard and began to thresh again, all the while watching the path. It was an hour before the policeman marched on the path from the Zhang's. Ling marched with them, but he did not look in my direction. My hand shook, though. All the rice I had winnowed tumbled out of my basket and was lost on the stones of the courtyard. Hana had not been well, and I did not dare worry her. Instead, I ran again to the Zhang's house and found Ling's baba and mama in the midst of upheaval. The neat rooms were turned upside down, and Ling's like they were a mess. And Ling's mama was sitting in a chair sobbing. They have taken my son, she wailed. Ling's baba tried to calm her. They found nothing. They will soon see their mistake and return him. I thought of the boy who had been arrested for speaking the truth, but said nothing of my fears. What happened? I asked. Ling's father said two policemen came and accused Ling of having foreign books. But though they turned the house upside down, they could find no such books. Still, they insisted on questioning him. He is a good boy and only tends his orchard. I told him to look at his trees and see if he was a dangerous man. I said what I could to comfort the Zangs and left, stopping in the stable on the way. The pile of manure was untouched, and I patted the beast, grateful for the fine hiding place he had made. All day I stayed in the courtyard watching the path, but Ling did not return. At daybreak, I was there again, still watching. I thought I might go into the village, for like everyone else, I knew where the small jail was. But should the policemen see me, they would be suspicious, and, they might, might, and that might make things worse for Ling. I could not worry Hana with the story, and I was afraid to go back to the Zangs, for the police might return there. I could only wait. Over and over, I tried to think what books might be dangerous, and over and over, I thought of the woman's son-in-law arrested for speaking the truth. If Ling's books spoke truth, maybe that was dangerous. Yet they had not found the books. Hana knew something was wrong. You live on air, not eating your rice or fish, she said. I'm restless. I finished the threshing and, threshing and most of the vegetables had been planted. Why can you not enjoy a little time to yourself, Hana said. If you must do something, go and help Ling with his trees. But I could not help Ling with his trees. I'll go into the village and get more radish seeds. There is yet room for another row or two. I hurried off, relieved to have some errand. The road to the village followed one paddy after another. Like ours, the paddies lay waiting for the first radish seeds to sprout. Now there was only brown earth with no bright green to lift the spirits. A rat scurried by in the ditch and magpies hovered on a light wind. In one paddy, a maku, a maku, a maku, M-A-Q-U-E, which means a sparrow-like bird, was snatching newly sown seeds. I thought that I must make another scarecrow so that our seeds would not be stolen by the little hungry birds. As I passed the paddies, the farmers at the hoeing looked up. Some who, some who knew me waved an arm in greeting and I waved back. It was early September and still warm. I longed to roll up my sleeves, but it would have been unseemly to appear in the village like that. I could hear the sounds of the village long before I reached it. The old men sat in the tea house, many of them with their bird cages. 
The butcher slew the flies that hovered over his mat meat, while the chickens and ducks clucked and squawked away in their cages. There was a crowd of children lined up to watch the Dean Shi, that's the t television. The locksmith was sharpening hose, and the man in the noodle shop waved, waiting for me to stop by for my bowl of noodles. I shook my head and hurried on. As I hurried into the street that led to the jail, for I could not keep away from it, I saw Ling. I looked hastily around, but no policeman was in sight. Ling was all by himself, hurrying along the road. I ran up to him. I wanted to fling my arms around him, but such a gesture would never do. Still, I could not keep my hands entirely from him, for I was not yet sure he was really there. He looked quickly around and, taking my hand in his, began to pull me away from the village. I saw that his hair was uncombed and his clothes were wrinkled, as if he had slept in them. His glasses, glasses set crookedly on his nose, the nose piece broken and fastened with tape. They kept me overnight, asking again and again about my books, but they had not found them and there was nothing else against me. I told them of how I made the orchard and begged them to talk to the agent in the village government office who has helped me through the pamphlets. They did talk with him and he told them I was just a farmer. Still, they will keep an eye on me. How did they know about the books? I send away for them and there are spies everywhere, even in the post office where the books are mailed. I have been foolish and have given my parents trouble and worry. As we talked, talked, we hurried along the uphill path toward Ling's house and I was out of breath. Are you finished then with such books? I managed to ask. I don't know. I hope the day will come when everyone can have books that tell the truth, he said. I told Ling, when I traveled to Shanghai, I talked to the woman whose son-in-law was arrested and sent to a re-education center because he spoke the truth. If you have books that speak the truth, isn't that just as dangerous? Dangerous, yes. But it is the books I had that made us remember what has happened to such people as the man you speak of. Are we to forget them? It would make their arrests even worse. There was no more time for talk. Ling's parents had seen us in the distance and were running toward us. I turned back to Hana's house. It would have been unseemly for me to be at the Zangs at such a time. Behind me, I could hear their happy cries. I was crying as well, but whether with relief or worry, I could not see, say. And that's the end of chapter 10. And we will read 11 and 12 next time.